office. I worked for a florist. I worked for a paper designer. I was like cleaning homes, dog walking. <laughs> I was doing whatever I could. I just like, I was like, I just don't want to go back to the corporate world. I really would love to make this happen. Welcome to the 24th episode of How I Built My Small Business, the show that is dedicated to sharing the insight that entrepreneurs have about how to start and grow small businesses. Join us as we unravel the stories behind their entrepreneurial journeys. I'm Ann McGinty, your host, and today we have Allison Hotchkiss chatting with us about her journey to becoming one of Vogue's top 50 best wedding planners around the world. Allison is the founder CEO of Allison Events. She is a destination wedding planner, event producer, luxury concierge, and now a third time author of Gorgeous Gatherings, a large format book that showcases some of her most stunning events. She has produced over 500 jaw dropping events in 15 countries and 29 cities. Her exquisite celebrations have been featured in Vogue. Brides, Martha Stewart Weddings, Elle Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and many more. You can find a link through to her business in the episode's description. Thank you to our listeners for being here today. Allison, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So let's start with some of the fun stuff. What are two or three of your most memorable events that you've produced and why? Gosh, I mean, there's so many memorable events, but if I had to nail it down to just a couple, one really favorite project of mine was post COVID. You know, those were the days when we were planning events and then stopped and then kind of replanned them. We did a beautiful wedding for a couple down in Atherton in the family backyard. And it's probably one of my most favorite galleries because it's kind of a nice juxtaposition between male and female and connecting to the kind of more romantic side of weddings, but also not getting too girly and sweet. It's funny, we were just looking at this yesterday with a gal who's redoing our website. And I think we tagged it as like, sexy. (laughs) I think that was the (laughs) word we used. But basically, it was a couple that was really into really modern and contemporary aesthetic in general. So everything from their home to their style to the places they like to visit, they were very much in line with kind of a more contemporary aesthetic. So we kind of went like total opposite of traditional wedding design. The look and feel was very black. It was like black on black on black. So we had a ceremony that was really pretty and in the center of their garden. But then when they went to dinner, they went to a matte black cladded open aired structure. So they dined under this structure that had a black sheer drape. It had black cycle carpet. We used black slate down the table with dripping white candles and beautiful almost like an art installation over the head table with white orchids and dried flowers. We partnered with this really incredible floral designer, Amanda with Studio Mondine. And she kind of has this Japanese Ikebana kind of style, like very minimalist aesthetic. So it was really fun to create this kind of outdoor dinner party, essentially, that was actually a wedding. So people arrived and they got to see a ceremony. We did a octagonal shaped stage in the middle of their garden with guest chairs in a circle around them. And then we cocktailed on another part of their garden. And then we're in this beautiful structure. We don't call it a tent, really more of a structure. And then guests evolved into the dancing structure, which was more of an apex style tent. So we had a higher ceiling with disco balls hanging down. And we had a matte black floor that they danced on with a DJ and lounges on either side. I just think aesthetically, like you just don't see black when you see weddings. And I thought that it was really kind of one of my showstoppers. Amazing. Okay, so there's one. Can you tell us about another one that is entirely different to that? Yes. Okay, so another one that's so totally different. We did a wedding in New Buffalo, Michigan. So the client lived in Chicago. New Buffalo is a small coastal, well, it's on the lake town about an hour from Michigan. This is like over 10 years ago. And funny enough, I know you had Kelsey Shopsky on the show. She was working for me at the time. So this is kind of like 
one of those pieces where like the memory bank is, is full there. And so the client owned the golf course where they wanted to have the reception. So we did the ceremony in the backyard of this client's home, very like simple backyard ceremony with the lake in the backdrop cocktails were around the lake. And then we golf carted 150 people down the street and through the golf course to the fifth hole, which is where we had the reception. So it was kind of this adventure. And we had all the drivers had little bow ties on and white shirts. Everyone got a roadie before they got on the golf cart. And we were just like constantly shuttling people. So then you get to the fifth hole, but you have to kind of go through half of the golf carts to get there. And then you were dropped off at the end of the fifth hole and you had to walk down, you know, 200 feet to enter the the tent. So it's kind of this dramatic entrance with this big sailcloth tent next to a little lake. And people had dinner there and and dined and danced and partied. And then when they left that tent, we put 200 luminary lights on the pathway back down the fifth hole. So they had to exit through this beautiful light lit path back into the golf carts and then back to the shuttle. So it was just like really fun. And I think the memorable pieces for me with a lot of these weddings either has to do with like the design and what it looks like or the adventure to get there. We had another small elopement wedding that we did during COVID because this client really wanted to get married. And, you know, there were so many rules around who you could travel with and getting tested before you went. And so we edited their larger wedding size to a group of 13 And we took them from the Bay Area to Amangiri, which is a property out in Canyon Point, Utah. It's an Amon property. And we did three days of really fun activities with both families, like a couple of their closest friends, kept it small and intimate. We did a party up on top of the mountain. It was like all these really big boulder like size rocks that you had to I I don't want to say climb up there because you could easily walk with like a proper shoe on but we did kind of go down this path at the top of this mountain and had welcome cocktails there with this drummer that the client was really close with we flew in from Lebanon and he played and it echoed around all the rocks and they had literally like Aperol spritz and Negronis on top of this mountain with this little lounge set up with 13 people and this drummer. And it was just like so spiritual and so intimate. And again, because we were all together, them plus the vendors, we all had tested. And so we weren't like in the mask world. We weren't worrying about getting or giving COVID to each other because we went through all the protocols. So it was nice to be free in a time when you couldn't really be free. They sound amazing. Yeah, it was really, it was really incredible. And that was just the first day. And then they had activities and yoga and spa services and nature hikes. And then the wedding day, we did in a totally different area of the property. And I actually officiated that wedding. So that was really special to me that I got to be a part of that. And then they had an intimate dinner. And then again, we had a DJ just for 13 people with a saxophone player that we brought in. And it was just like such an epic dance party. They sound like epic experiences. Like I just want to go to one of these events and participate. Well, it's funny. It's changed so much. You know, I've been doing this. I'll be in my 24th year this year of of planning events, mostly weddings, but we do birthday parties and anniversaries. And you know, when I started, a wedding planner just like kind of organized the vendors and put flowers on the table and made sure that everyone showed up on time and put their boutonniere on. And now it's like full immersion experiences. They're weekend long. You know, you're taking people afar into places and the more adventure, I think, the more people love it. So we have a big role these days. (laughs) Yes. So how did you originally learn the skills you needed to put on these incredible event productions? I mean, when I went to college, I went to school in Colorado and my degree at the time was called natural resources, recreation and tourism. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just liked snowboarding and having fun. And I knew I liked organizing activities and groups, but I didn't even really know what that career was called. And even my career coach at the time didn't really know what that was called. So when I graduated, this was (laughs) pre-Google, you know, you open up the paper and you're like, what seems fun? And there was an event planning job that was like working with 
groups of people coming from New Zealand. And I actually had studied in New Zealand for a year. So I was like, oh, I know New Zealand. And it was coordinating groups and taking them all around Los Angeles. And so I started to do that first out the gate and really enjoyed it. I enjoyed being reconnected back with New Zealanders. And I kind of felt like I understood the people and the things that they wanted to learn about. And that kind of led me into another event planning job where I really was doing more specific planning and coordinating like airport transfers and activities for corporate groups. And I was doing dine around dinners and I was putting together these big themed parties. So that's kind of like how I I got my feet wet and how I moved into weddings was I transferred with a company in Los Angeles, moved up to San Francisco, kind of was chasing a boy at the time, but also had an opportunity (laughs) to work at this other company. And I had a friend who was like, you know, you might like want to work for wedding planners. Like maybe you should try and do weddings. She was a photographer and she had been shooting for a lot of different wedding planners. And this is when, you know, Martha Stewart was like all the rage. That was like, you know, the height of Martha Stewart days where you would pick up that magazine and like read it cover to cover if you were in the wedding industry. And she's like, you know, I think people make like a thousand dollars in a day. You should maybe consider doing that on the side. And so I was like, okay, yeah. $1,000 a day, like, hell yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally taking this job. So I started to research, like, who are wedding planners in the Bay Area? And like, maybe I could just pick up some weekend work. And so I kind of like, sent my resume out to all the wedding planners at the time, which there really weren't that many. I'd say there was maybe like five people that really came up. And I went and worked for all of them. And I was I was working for them. I was like, this is so much easier than doing corporate events. It's so much more fun. There's so much more flexibility. And I don't know if I would describe it as easy. I mean, you make it look easy. No, it's it's emotionally not easy, but it felt easier than my corporate job at the time. Now I would say I think corporate jobs are a lot easier than doing weddings because there's so many more layers now and choices and options. But at the time I was like, you know, so I, I ended up freelancing for a bunch of these planners and they were like old. And to me, you know, as a 25 year old, old was 40. Okay. And now I'm almost 50, but (laughs) I was like, these old ladies, I could crush them up and down these stairs. You know, (laughs) I kept thinking like, how hard is this? But I did realize very quickly that I knew nothing about all the different religions and all the rules and the Emily post rules. And I like, you know, I had to quickly study up and and fake it till I made it a little bit too. You know, I didn't know all the answers. I remember I was in the car with my mom at one point. Oh, I was on the call with a client. I was like, mom, don't talk. You know, she's calling about hair and makeup. And my mom looked at me like, what the hell? You don't even wear makeup. You don't know anything. I was like, I know, I know. I just got to tell her. You know, I'm just, I'm, I got this. And I like took this call and she was stressing about hair and makeup. And it was the first time I had had a bride that was really concerned. She didn't like the trial and somehow I got her off the ledge and got her in with another hair and makeup. But I remember my mom, she was like, Oh my God, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. But like a lot of the times you don't in the beginning of what you're doing, you're learning, you know, at this point you were working for these other event planners. When did you decide to just start your own and no longer work for the other planners? Well, it's interesting. At the time that I was working for this corporate event planning company and I was freelancing, it was like right before like the whole dot-com bust. So it happened at the same time where I got laid off from my corporate job. In the meantime, I quickly was putting my resume together and telling like every wedding planner I'd worked for and florist and caterer and event managers, like, send me leads. Like, I'll take whatever swag you want. I'll take any leftover, anything. So I was taking anything and everything and started to do that while I was freelancing for the planners. I worked for a florist. I worked for a paper designer. I was like cleaning homes. I was doing whatever I could. I just like, I was like, I just don't want to go back to the corporate world. I really would love to make this happen. So I somehow like scrapped enough business to make it through the first two years of doing these day of jobs, partial jobs, assisting dog walking, house cleaning. (laughs) Amazing. Do you remember what your first client was? Yeah, that was the client I was just telling you about with the hair and makeup. I bet she paid me $500. Okay. For like (laughs) month of or whatever, which now that would be like 
$5,000 and I wouldn't even touch a day of project at this point. She was using me hard and I didn't know. So I was letting her use me and she got married in Tahoe. So to me, I was like, Ooh, exciting. It's like in a new place. And I got to drive up there and check it out. So yeah, I did her wedding in Tahoe. And then my second wedding, I remember very clearly was the photographer, Thayer Allison Gowdy, who was like incredibly supportive of me very early on in my career. She referred me to another photographer who was getting married in Kauai. And so I remember doing her wedding. And I think I was like, pay me 1500 fly me there and my boyfriend and we have a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing both Bay Area projects and whatever destination jobs I could get so that I could travel, really. And how many events are you producing a year now? Oh, I mean, now, so I, I take on anywhere between like four and six clients a year. And that properly represents, you know, two to four events per client. So I'd say I'm producing 15 to 20 events a year, but I'm really only working with a small select group of clients. Whereas when I started my business, I had probably 25 clients and, you know, was doing two to three events for those. I, it was crazy. Yeah, I was just doing as much as I could. That is so interesting. So if somebody came to you today, you wouldn't necessarily do the work for them. Well, no, I mean, obviously, I'm in a very different place than I was 25 years ago, you know, like our fees are they're high, like our average starting budget, 800,000 to a million. So, you know, we're not just putting flowers on the table, we're like building mini communities and villages. And sometimes are working five to 10 days before the guests even arrive to create that community. And then we're managing, you know, activities all day, guest arrival, all the different events, you know, multiple different entertainments. Sometimes we have a headliner. Sometimes we have VIPs and we have to deal with security. Sometimes it's planes, trains, and automobiles to get there. So the logistics and the stakes are so much higher. So, you know, I've got three girls that work for me and, and we're just working on those six projects all day long. <laughs> Amazing. So what are the preliminary questions that you will ask to understand what it is that they're wanting to create? Yeah. So we asked probably a lot of similar questions that like an interior designer would ask about, you know, okay, you want to design your home and, you know, how are we going to make this customized and personalized to you? You can unravel a, a lot related to travel, where they've traveled to, what countries, towns, cities, islands, where they like to stay. Like, you know, you get the Amon junkie person versus somebody who's loyal to like, Four Seasons versus somebody who likes more boutique hotels. Where do they like to shop? Who are their style icons? You know, and sometimes the answers are like, I don't know. And I don't have any of these, you know, so we really try, we try and dig into, are they buying Gucci and Prada or are they going to Zara or do they like to mix like a Target with a Suzanne with a Gucci with, you know, it's like the high low or are they only going high or like, where do they fall on the spectrum? What do they do for fun? Do they have animals? What do they both do for a living? You know, sometimes this can help us understand kind of what they might be like to work with attorneys versus stay at home mom versus Google tech executive versus interior designer versus publicist. You know, they all kind of help us understand a little bit about what they might be into. Where do they live? What's like the best wedding they ever went to and why? What's one of their favorite parties? What do they have any pet peeves? It's almost like dating. You know, it's like when you first start dating, you kind of ask a lot of these random questions, but you start to unravel. It's like you kind of know in the first couple minutes if you're connecting, if it's feeling like it might be a right fit. And I'm sure it's the same thing for the client as well. So we ask a lot of those questions. Sometimes on the call, Sometimes, you know, after the call, sometimes it's a follow up questionnaire to better understand who they are. Once you have an understanding of who they are and the vision that they might have, how do you approach the creative process from there? I mean, what what are the next steps? What happens? What's your order of workflow? Yeah. So once we've signed on with a client, our contract's been signed and our deposit has been paid we typically like to start out the gate with a budget because that's just like the starting point for everything is really having transparency about, you know, what we think it's going to cost to produce the thing that they want. We usually have that conversation on the phone. Like, 
okay, you have this many people and you want to do it here, you know, the last time we worked there or, or my understanding is that's a more challenging island to work at, or that country has a lot of rules related to importing or like we, we try and break it down on the call, but really like starting off with a budget. And then once we have a budget and sometimes honestly, we can't create a low to high budget out the gate if we don't know the where, but we might have a preliminary idea of this is roughly what we think you're going to spend. At that point, it's really identifying the where, because we can't really get too creative unless we know where it is happening. If it's in Hawaii or in an island versus a desert versus in a mountain versus in a backyard, you know, there's a lot of fixed things that we have to work around. Are we going to lean into the whole mountain vibe? Are we going for rustic and mountain-like aesthetic? Or do we want to totally go the opposite? You know, we did this wedding in Jackson Hole and they really wanted like an English garden in the mountains. So (laughs) we had to really identify that. And she really had an aversion to anything mountain. She didn't want anything rustic. She really wanted like, really to lean into something that felt more her and her heritage and her, she had been brought up. Her mother was living in London at that time and they had a lot of connection to the gardens there. So, you know, that had its own story where we have other clients who are like, no, if we're doing it in Hawaii, like I want it to be all about tropical and green and lush. And I don't want to fabricate things that don't feel like they're meant to be there. So it's really unraveling. What are those pieces? How does your team stay organized and keep track of all of the pieces when juggling the planning for multiple events all at the same time? I know you would think we'd be using some prolific software, but we don't. (laughs) We really use like chat group. We use Excel. We use pages. We use InDesign. We use Word. We really keep our systems fairly simple. But how it works is we have one person who's in charge of food and beverage And that's like all on them. Everything related to the items that the guests are eating for their meals, food that's related to activities, presentation of the food, presentation of the cocktails. And she's really kind of managing the look and feel. But that's like her whole primary role. And it's a big part of the process. We have another person that's dedicated to running the project and they essentially executive produce the job. So we used to do all of our own design in-house. I designed events for years and years and years and had different creative people working for me who were also doing the design. But as of this year, we've actually moved into a new approach where we're going to be partnering with a designer and we'll still executive produce the job, but won't be like actually doing the design decks and actually working with a production company to do the renderings. And the reason being is we're just doing such big projects now. It's such a giant amount of work. And we feel like the logistics play just as equally, if not a bigger role than the look and feel of things that we've kind of decided that we're going to oversee that whole process, but we're not necessarily going to be doing that piece. So we have several different designers that we're partnering for our future jobs, which we're really excited about. I feel like it gives the client a better opportunity to have more experience and more opinions and more ideas than just having it come with us. So we have one person that's in charge of the project and they're the executive producer. And essentially they manage the creative process as well as all the other bits that go into the project. And then we have an event director and she's in charge of like all things related to budget numbers and when vendors payments are due and working with the client on the timeline and the production schedule and those sorts of things. And then when we're actually working the weekend of, we may have two, four, eight additional freelancers that can assist. Like we have a a concierge division of our company, but they're two gals that have their own business that live in another city. And when we need the concierge services, we bring them on, pay them as freelancers, and they manage all things related to activities. So for example, we have a 50th birthday party we just did in Cabo, and we have another one actually coming up in two weeks. And they were primarily responsible for communicating to the 40 to 50 different people that were coming. So like, what flight are they on? What's their transfer going to look like? What activities they want to participate in? What's their dietary? They answer questions related to what you should wear, what the weather might be. Can I get a babysitter? Can I get a tea time? And they're kind of dedicated to that. But that's a a piece that we don't do in-house because we don't necessarily need it for all of our projects. So that's kind of how it works. This is an incredible operation that you're running. (laughs) I think bringing on the designers sounds like a great 
smart move. Well, again, back in the day, I mean, I would literally like there was nothing. There were no rentals. I would have to like we did this wedding in Costa Rica and I literally had to go to the rodeo and rent chairs and tables. There was no linen company you know, that was doing like unique and interesting things. It was all cotton poly linens. And now you can get any type of fabric, anything custom made so easily. And so I understand what it takes to custom build things and create things. But now, you know, there is a lot of resources that are available all over the country. And the designer and also too, you know, a lot of our clients, they don't want the thing that somebody else had. So we're custom building so many things and fabricating dance floors and fabric backdrops and just the fabrication and customization piece is so much bigger than it ever was. And it's not just tabletop and rentals. It's also tenting. We're like creating custom structures and cladding existing structures to make them Pantone color match the bars or the dance floor. It's a different can of worms than it was a long time ago. So it's exciting. I am so impressed with what you're doing. So can you tell us about one of the most challenging events that you produced? You know, I did this wedding 10 plus years ago in the South of France for a couple who they had about 250 people coming from Hong Kong. And the idea was that they would do a small rehearsal dinner, a welcome reception and the wedding. And then the next day, the parents were having their 20th wedding anniversary. Oh my gosh. So Big budget, a lot of people, and then they hired Coldplay to perform the headliner for the wedding night. And then the second na- night for the wedding anniversary was Paul Anka. So we had to not only like get through the first three days, which is already a beast in itself, but then after Coldplay was over, we basically within 24 hours had to entirely flip the space. This is at a, a hotel in the South of France called Hotel du Cap, and it is not an easy hotel to work at. We had to flip the space from the Coldplay setup. And I don't know if you know much about like headliners and all of their needs related to backline, but it's layered and complicated. And it, you're like, but you play guitar and you're also going to have a band. Can't you just like use the same equipment? Like, no, you can't. And they have a completely different stage setup and sound system. So we had to break down like everything related to the entire 24 hours it took us to put together for Coldplay and redo it for Paul and Cassette. Then we also had to flip the dining space so that when people came back that were invited to the 20th anniversary, it felt like a totally new space. <laughs> so we we joke about it because we were there for like, 14 days and we had like a village a whole tent set up on their tennis courts that we took over and created essentially like a village for us to be able to work through all of these logistics now I hired a production company in France to do all the heavy lifting because it was like no way that my little team was going to be able to pull that off but I learned a lot from that project and thank god nothing went wrong the weather gods came in I got to meet Chris Martin, who's just a delightful, lovely human. I got to meet Paul Anka, which I remember calling my dad the day before. And I was like, who's Paul Anka? He's like, started laughing. So that was fun. And yeah, no one got hurt and no one died. And and everyone went home happy. <laughs> That's success. <laughs> so with all of these international locations, what do you do about navigating permits and visas as an American business operating in another country? <laughs> I mean, that is such a fun conversation. Wow. Yes, it is a journey. uh, Let me say at the very least, (laughs) because as you can imagine with every foreign country, their requirements are different for visas from country to country. Also, the process is very different for the paperwork related to customs and importing and exporting. So for like example, we did a wedding this past year in Anguilla, and that was probably the most challenging location I've ever done a wedding at, which seems so silly because it's like, there's what, four luxury hotels on the island and a couple other small hotels. It's not like that big of an island, but they're just old school. So they like wanted blood work and a urine test for every single staff that was coming in, plus a fee of like a thousand dollars, plus multiple headshots, plus you had to go to your doctor, you had to get a police report, like just like silly things on there that would be more relevant to somebody who was coming from like another country that was coming to work there permanently. But we were obviously there for a wedding. We were only going to be there for five or six days. And they just 
they had the same permit process. So it was such a pain in the ass. And not only that, but it requires a full-time person. So what we had to do for that project is literally have a dedicated person who could manage making sure that the band photographer, videographer, florist, like everyone that was coming in was filling out the paperwork properly. And that the time gap for when things were getting approved was like weeks in advance. And we like barely made it. So there's that process. And then there's like Mexico where I've never filled out any paperwork to do anything to come in and out of that country. Cause they, they don't, they don't care. They're psyched to get our money. And then there's other places, you know, that have their own challenges. So what we've learned in the past is to really understand when we're working in a new foreign country, like what requirements are going to be needed in advance of what that's going to cost. And we have a dedicated person that oversees it to move the needle for every vendor that's involved in getting across that finish line. But it sounds like it's never been a total roadblock, like a total no. I mean, yes, correct. There has been, you know, if I'm being totally transparent and hopefully I'm not going to get arrested at some point for saying this, but there has (laughs) been a moment where we've been like, okay, band, you guys are guests and you will not be, you know, usually it's not good with a band. Let's just say, if you're saying the band is a guest, you're like your friends of the bride and groom and you're coming in as friends to perform, you're not being paid, and you're a guest at the wedding. So we have had to do that in the past when we just like ran out of time to be able to have everybody come in, and it has worked in a small scale. But, you know, you're kind of paranoid the whole way through because, God forbid, they're like, no, stop. Chances are they're not going to actually really check and come to the event, so. And honestly, you know, we do also travel with cash, (laughs) Sometimes money helps in foreign countries if someone's giving you a hard time. Oh <laughs> it's funny. I We did this That's one wedding. Epic. This was a long time ago. I think I was with Kelsey at the time. We were in Canada and we're like, we brought a printer, like chargers. I mean, we had like seven suitcases and all these linens. And this is like back in the day, we didn't really know. <laughs> and we didn't know we needed a car name. We didn't know we needed to like tell them in advance what we we're bringing and the value of each item so that they knew we were bringing it back out. So the security guy's like, he's like looking close at the screen and he's like, is that a printer? We're like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Are those candles? <laughs> yeah, those are candles. Is that a, you know, and it was just like listing one item after another. And we were like, we're so screwed. He's totally <laughs> going to give us a hard time. We're not going to make it through. And then we got all the like six suitcases through, you know, to go to wherever we're going in Canada for the three days. And he's like, okay, have a nice day. We were like, oh my God. So we did make it. I had another wedding I did in Scotland and we had brought all the linens with us and decided we were going to ship them back right? I don't know why we decided we weren't going to bring them back with us. But you know, bringing like, kind of damp, stained, soiled linens with you in your bag is kind of gross. I mean, we've done it a million times, but we shipped the linens back and they got held up in customs because they didn't have the proper paperwork from the hotel that shipped them. They went back, long story short, three months later, the linens got back. And that's happened a ton of times. You know, customs doesn't really care. They're just sitting there like, Ah, I'm going to get this guy. (laughs) (laughs) So we've been in trouble a couple of times, unfortunately, out of our control. And so staying in that overseas realm, how do you approach cultural sensitivity and diversity when you are planning these events? Because I would assume like if you're doing a wedding in Japan or if you're doing one in Scotland, that they have a certain way of doing things or expectations for how the event rolls out. Ooh. Yeah, Japan is tough. We've done a couple weddings in Japan and it is tricky because they're not really no people. So then they're yes people, but then they're no people when you get there. So it's, you know, they're very hard rule followers. So that's a tricky one. I mean, my solution to working in any foreign country is to hire someone local that speaks the language and understands the culture and customs. And we do that almost every single time we have a project in a different country. They also know like the pet peeves and the, you know, the pros and cons of working at venues and that sort of thing. So that's mostly what we do now is understand that. But you do have to have a sensitivity around how do they do business? When I did that wedding in France, we would sit down and have a conversation you know, over lunch. And I thought we were like talking business during lunch. 
And they were like bringing bottles of rosé out. We were in five courses. And I was like, guys, we got to get this moving. You know, we got to get to work. And I realized very quickly that, first of all, that's like not the way that they do business. They don't talk about business when they're having lunch. They really keep their lunch as their special break in the middle of the day that they take two hours on. So I learned a couple things. I learned one, pull back the reins on talking about all things related to the event. Ask them about their family, get to know them, make that a time where you can connect with them. And also make sure after you drink those four glasses of wine that you have a couple of espressos because you got to get back to work and actually function. So that is one thing I learned in Europe and in Japan, same thing. Like they don't talk business during lunch at all. And it's another thing that sometimes you learn when you go and sometimes you get some tips in advance and Back in the day when I used to travel, I always got the four doors or the lonely planet guides. And I always remember looking at like, what are the like 20 words you need to know? Like you need to know how to say hi and thank you. And where's the bathroom and excuse me. And so I always try and learn the basics if I don't know that. And just kind of the cultural norms, like don't chew gum or, you know, different etiquette around dining and what you say and what work you use and it's confusing, but I do the best that I can to try and understand how to be more like the way they do it. Like in Mexico, you know, they take that siesta. That's like real. They're like, you know, it's time to relax. It's lunchtime. Don't talk to me about moving that chair right now. Cause I'm on break. <laughs> it sounds like such a rich experience that you have just with all of the travel and the cultures and then working with different companies all over the place. How do you personally or as a team measure the success of one of the events that you produce? Honestly, if people aren't telling us how amazing it was by the end of event, then I think we have a problem. And it's pretty rare that people aren't like, oh my God, this was so much fun. The bride's like, this is my favorite day. The mom's like, oh my God, you saved the day. I think if there was a scenario where we weren't getting rave reviews, I would be self-reflecting pretty hard. I mean, we always have a team meeting and reflect back on like, what could we have done better? What would we have done different? So we self-reflect internally as a team. And sometimes we even have that self-reflection with some of our vendors, our tending vendor, our florist, or what have you, because we know that nothing goes perfect by any means, but we know that we pulled it off and there was a ton of shit that went down behind the scenes that the client will never experience, but we might've been like the air conditioning, we had this wedding in Tulsa and literally the air conditioning broke two hours before guests entered into the tent. We were freaking out. Everyone was like dripping sweat. I've never been so disgusting in my life. And like somehow we got it to fix and it was cool enough. And, you know, there's so much stuff that goes behind the scenes. So, you know, if no one dies, no one complains, (laughs) no one gets hurt, (laughs) no one gets food poisoning, you know, those are success rates. But, But overall, like, if people aren't raving to us, then we know we have a problem. So usually people are pretty happy. And also too, you know, like we get the final event photos. If you look at our design decks and you look at our final event photos, they should look pretty damn similar. And if they don't, you know, then we know something turned out a little different than we were hoping and which does happen too. Sometimes it turns out better than we were originally hoping. But yeah, I think the measure is in the, is in the thank yous and the, the gushing of like, thank you for being so kind or thank you for managing this. And, and sometimes clients, you know, because a lot of our clients have traveled the world, they've been to all their other weddings that are really high end and they've experienced so many things. They've kind of seen it all. So it, sometimes it's hard to impress people. But if somebody was just like, thank you for being kind and your staff was really helpful with X, you know, those are all things that really matter to us. And tell us about the book that you have that's coming out. This is my third book with Chronicle. Chronicle is a publishing company based here in San Francisco. And it is a coffee table book called Gorgeous Gatherings. It comes out in October. And it's a book dedicated to like how we designed these events based on the space that it took place in. So it goes from New York City to Tahiti to Mexico to Japan to Santa Ynez. But basically, it's not about the couple. And it's not about what they wanted, per se about like their story, the narrative is based around how we came up with the design and the look and feel based on where the event is taking place. 
So it's a very photo heavy book. It's all images of weddings and events that I've done with Norman and Blake photography the last like eight years with a couple, there's like two or three new galleries that we shot specifically for the book. So it's like a really fun, beautiful, full bleed, large coffee table book with a lot of inspiration and a lot of ideas around how do you get creative related to tenting, lighting, food and beverage, choosing locations, coming up with creative gifting. It really is all the touch points when planning an event. So I'm really, really proud about it and really excited for it to come out. Oh, that must feel incredible to have the highlights of your work put in print. So I've got two more questions for you. What advice would you give to someone aspiring to become an entrepreneur? Yeah, well, I think this advice is helpful, whether you're an entrepreneur, an event planner, or an architect. I think boundaries is something that's incredibly important as an entrepreneur. Like I said, when I first started, I was a baby bird. So I kind of did anything and everything in order to make the client happy and and keep the project moving. And, you know, I feel like I really compromised my friendships and my relationships and my ability to be present when I wasn't working. Work-life balance was not a priority for me in the beginning. And I think about 10 years ago, you know, that all kind of changed. And then I had my daughter who's now nine and I had to have boundaries, you know, and I also had to really instill confidence in my staff and that I have a very educated team of people who are here to help you. And it's not, my name might be on the door, but honestly, like they're completely running the ship and they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting and I'm always available if there's questions, but it takes an army to put anything together and being able to say like, my work hours are this, and I'm unavailable to talk to you, whether it's these two hours or these seven days I'm on vacation. You know, my colleagues laugh at me because they're like, how do you have these boundaries? I'm like, if I'm going on vacation with my kid, it is like precious, you know, those days are precious. And of course, if there is a diehard emergency, I'm always available. I mean, that phone is practically attached to my body. But I just appreciate that they understand that I need the space to have to be amazing to them as much as they're going to need my full attention. When it comes week of their wedding, I am like all hands on deck. You can talk to me until two o'clock in the morning. No one ever does that because they learn the boundaries early on. But I just think that that would be my biggest advice. And I think you have better workflow too, when you also give yourself kind of a set time that you're available and at your best. It can be very tricky separating work from life takes practice. Totally. And listen, I'm no, I'm not perfect at it. I mean, my daughter will be like, mom, get off your phone. (laughs) And I'm like, I just have to send this quick text. So it still happens because you're fully responsible at the end of the day as the entrepreneur, it's all on you unless you have a partner. So there are times when you have to kind of break your own rules, but it's a good practice to start with. Even when I had you know, all the girls were working in the office, which now they're all based all over the place. But, you know, we would take an hour lunch and we'd sit down with our brown bag, if you will, and we would shoot the shit and talk about things that weren't related to weddings and try and decompress or go to a yoga class. It was really, it was really nice. So for a closing question, if you could go back and talk to yourself when you were in your early 20s, what would you say? I think the other advice I would give myself, everyone has some level of drama, whether it's in their family or with their friends. I would just say that you need to have armor on at all times because you cannot take stuff personally that aren't about you. You're just standing in the middle of when that emotion is being felt and when it's being communicated. So I always say, okay, girls, like put on your armor or going in for the next three days, everything that comes on bounces off that's not about you and just have compassion that it probably has something to do with something else. And all you can do is be a sounding board and supportive and try and not take it personally. That's great advice for so many situations. (laughs) (laughs) When it's just beyond your control and yes, you have to just not let it impact you. I mean, listen, easier said than done, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing everything that you know. Oh, thanks so much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thanks again for being here. Today's key takeaways. 
In college and after, it's common not to have a clear career path, and that's okay. Enjoy the journey, gain experience, and learn as much as you can. If you're interested in starting an event planning business, get your feet wet by working in all angles of the event world. You can work with photographers, florists, concierge businesses, and freelance for several event planners. Ask them to put you on a list to contact if any need arises and jump at the opportunity to help and learn. If you're lacking in the principles of etiquette, learn the Emily Post rules. I'll include a link in the episode notes. At the beginning of any new venture, you probably won't really know what you're doing because you're learning. Push yourself, but keep your expectations low because the first two years can be some of the hardest. Event planning today has morphed into being more than just organizing the vendors and invites. If you want to climb the event planner ranks, expand your offerings with custom curation, more adventure, and give guests more reasons to talk about the experience. And this will fuel organic growth of your business. Look at the organizational structure of your team to accommodate growth. For an event planner, consider having one person in charge of food and beverage, one person dedicated to running the project and executive producing the event, an event director to handle budget numbers and vendor payments, and a dedicated person to take care of visas and permits for international events. Then you can collaborate with third-party vendors, including designers, freelancers for day of, and concierge services on an as-needed basis. Know your boundaries and set your available work hours and days. Don't compromise your friendships and relationships, and don't forget to be present when you aren't working. Lastly, everyone has some level of drama in their life. Don't take things too personally. Allow irrelevant matters to bounce off and have compassion for others dealing with stress. That's it for today. I release episodes once a week, so come back and check it out. Have a great day. Thank you.